Public affairs programming on WQPT is brought to you by The Singh Group at Merrill Lynch. Serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years. A change in church leadership. The head of the Catholic Church in Eastern Iowa ready to retire. We talk with Bishop Martin Amos. And cyclists from throughout the region are gearing up for a revamped criterium in the cities. Bishop Martin John Amos is 75 years young, but on his birthday last December, he offered his resignation to Pope Francis. It was accepted, and next month, a new bishop will lead the Davenport Diocese, which represents Catholic churches from Clinton to Keokuk, from Newton to Davenport and Bettendorf. 78 parishes representing about 100,000 Catholics. And joining us is Bishop Martin Amos. Welcome to our program, Your Excellency. Thank it's you very much. you again. It's nice to be here again, Jim. Bittersweet, I would assume. Yes. More, more sweet. <laughs> <laughs> well, because it, it, it is mandatory for you to submit the resignation yeah. on your 75th birthday, so this is not a big surprise. No, not at the all. The Pope accepting it is not a big surprise at all, and the transition is meant to be as smooth as possible. That's right. The, it's interesting, the Code of Canon Law says you, 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 you may submit your resignation or something like, like that, but you submit your resignation <laughs> when you're 75. <laughs> Do you think it's time? Do you think it's ready? You still have so much to offer, so much to give. Well, I remain a bishop. I won't right. stop being a bishop, so I'll, I'll continue to minister, but I won't have to go to all the meetings that are called board <laughs> meetings. <laughs> For a reason. <laughs> there you go, there you go. So it'll, it'll be nice not to be in charge. Yeah. I can just do the things I want to do. It'll be fine. I love ministry, so I have no problem doing that. Well, that's absolutely perfect then. Mm -hmm. It is. You're looking back at, did, did it fly by coming to Davenport? I mean, it's a city that you didn't know that well? I didn't know at all. Exactly. Well, you know what? Can I share a story that you had shared earlier? Is that you don't like cold weather. Right. And there was another bishop opening at the, about the same time the Davenport one was opening. Where was that? That was Hawaii. <laughs> I didn't get Hawaii. I got Davenport. Well, we're happy. But I'm happy about we're happy it. happy as I well. Am too. I'm happy about it, too. Looking back, has it flown by? I mean, uh, uh, you came and to Davenport at a time of crisis. And, and, and the church has really recovered under your administration, oh, under you. your tutelage. Thank you. It's, it's, it's flown by. It has, I have to say that. And there certainly were days when I thought, I don't know how much longer this can continue on, but right. for the most part, it's flown by. And, and, and so, like we said, when you arrived, it was like, what, two days after uh, the diocese had filed for bankruptcy, bankruptcy. Uh, church property had to be sold. Yep. Um, it was a really dark time. Is that almost nice that you arrived at such a bad time to move forward? You were able to make that transi transition, that is, for the church to move forward in the Quad Cities? I couldn't break it. Yeah. So it was good. <laughs> so it, was, it was good. And, and you really needed somebody fresh to come in. And people mm -hmm. were so good. They were so good. They were ready, you know, to let's deal with this. Let's settle things and move. Were you worried that at a crisis like that, people may not stand by the church? that, that oh, people sure. would leave and, and yeah. did you see a great drop off that you've been able to bring back uh, more to the flock? No, certainly the people I interacted with, no, they were very, very supportive. I couldn't have asked for a, a nicer group of people to be working with in the diocese. I like, wonderful. I like another thing. What lessons have you learned as bishop of our diocese? You don't mind if I share this? <laughs> you said you can't please all of the people all of the time and some you can't please at all. <laughs> That's very true. That's absolutely <laughs> so true. So what you're saying is your business isn't much different than all the rest of us. That's right. <laughs> it's just that I have 100,000 people who re I report to. <laughs> Did, what, were there challenges that you weren't expecting? Well, I was auxiliary bishop for five years. Yeah, so you knew. So I, I kind of knew what to expect. But I mean, the bankruptcy, of course, was a whole new ball game to me. I didn't, I've never done anything like that. But other than that, no, people are just so nice. They really are. And some of the ministry stuff that I did, all the confirmations and that stuff, when you go to parishes for that, it's always nice. Well, always and you were nice. saying that one of the greatest <clears throat> things is to be able to uh, uh, talk about uh, the, the seminarians, the, the oh, people yeah. that are entering the priesthood. Yes. Tell me a little bit about that because that is such a, I don't want to say crisis, but that is such a uh, major issue for the Catholic Church is to keep it alive and bring the young people yeah. into the ministry. Not even just into the ministry, but the whole idea, we've got to engage the young people. And that's what Francis is, Pope Francis is doing, too, with the, the synod that's going to take place. It's for young people and vocations, and he's thinking 16 to 29-year-olds. 
So they're going to be having, we've already started discussions about that. How do you engage them? How do you keep them? Because that, that's where the next, the next generation is. Well, how do you do it? <laughs> I mean, you tell me. And that's yeah, I know exactly. Be, and then we have it all figured <laughs> out. Right. Because yeah. uh, uh, have you one of the one of the other problems for for churches these days is how many people don't even really even register themselves as being of a, f a particular faith. Right. And, and, and you have noted that Catholics are not unlike any sure. of the other religions. Sure. And, and and you're having a real problem perhaps with the more secularism that we're seeing. Oh, in I society. think that's very true. You know, you, and, and then you go to Europe where it's hundred times worse than it is here. I mean, we still have a, a very, very uh, core group of people who are just, you know, very committed. But that is a challenge. The, the whole secularism, materialism, individualism, it, those are all challenges. But, you know, and, and I kind of think, though, I think back to the very early church when there's a small, small, small group of people and they were able to change the world. The world. Why can't we? Mm -hmm. And once again, we don't have the answer today. You're no, not going to give me that right. answer? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about what you're going to be doing. Uh, now, you'll be stepping down. This new guy knows a little bit about this area. Tell me a little bit about uh, your successor. He's, uh, he's from Dubuque. He's right. a priest of Dubuque. Uh, I've just met him several weeks ago. Uh, very down to earth. Grew up on a farm. A rather large family. Uh, he's got a, a civil uh, law degree. He's got mm -hmm. a canon law degree. Uh, he's currently the rector of their seminary uh, at Loris, and uh, I think he's going to be a perfect match. Yeah? Uh, yeah, I'm really excited about it. D does the church really change that much when a new bishop comes in? Well, my staff is kind of worried. <laughs> <laughs> sure it does. Oh, sure. He's going to see things that I didn't see. He's going to do things that I didn't get a chance to. He's 60 years old, mm -hmm. so, he, you know, he's got... I'm 15 years older. He's got a lot more energy than I do. <laughs> now, you plan on staying here for a while, like you said, but not f forever? Because, in a way, you want to step off the stage and not really be behind right. the curtain. That's right. So I, I do plan on going back to Cleveland by the 1st of July, 2nd of July. Um, I have a cottage there that I'm going to stay and have it with another priest. I'll stay there. Um, you're not He's, worried about the Ohio winters? They're so much better than ours? They're exactly the same. <laughs> I was here. thinking that, exactly. <laughs> we get Lake Erie snow there. Here we get uh, the pile up from the winds blowing across the fields. Absolutely. Same, same, same it's weather. It's following you. It's following you. Yeah, well, it will there too, because <laughs> whatever we have here, they get next. <laughs> what is your proudest accomplishment? What do you think that you, what is your mark here in the diocese? People have asked me that. And I, I, I think that's for somebody else in history mm. to figure out what it is. I've just tried to plot along and do what I'm supposed to do. And, and so. as an administrator, I mean, it's not only the church, it's the schools as well. I mean, are, oh, yeah. are you real proud of how the Catholic schools have been able to survive oh. and thrive in many ways? Yes, yes. I, I, I mean, the education is marvelous, and the, the fact that you can bring the faith into it is, is just, it, it, they're great. What they're do you great. see as the future there? Because when we're talking about tough times, Parochial schools have had a very difficult time yeah. keeping enrollment up and making sure you have qualified teachers, making sure that you've got education standards that you want. That's been a major struggle yeah. that, that seems to be getting better. You know, I, I think you have very dedicated uh, teachers in the public school. There's no question mm -hmm. about it. But if you want to teach in a Catholic school, you're not going to get the same salary. So it has to be a ministry for you. It has to be something that you want to do specifically as a ministry. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, we have some very dedicated teachers, obviously. It's, it's difficult financially, you know, parishes have to, for the most part, you can't be all tuition, so parishes have to support it, and that's hard. And, and some of our smaller places um, where, where you don't have the large farms with large families and that you don't have the large populations, it's it's very difficult for some of the smaller areas. You were talking about the church and making sure that you kept young people actively involved, uh, if not more so. And, and so many social issues are at the mm -hmm. forefront right now. We're seeing um, uh, legalized same-sex marriage. We're seeing um, abortion rights being argued here and there. Is this like at the center of the church uh, issues like these when it comes to dealing with keeping people within the faith or bringing young people in? Is that these are issues the church has to, to deal with head on? Well, you have to definitely deal with them head on, no question about it. I think the, the, the thing that we have to offer is a moral compass. Mm -hmm. uh, people are going to have to make decisions what they want to do, but I, I think it's very clear 
why we hold what we do because of these principles that we have. And so it's, it, if, if you really study the issues, uh, you may still disagree with them, but it's pretty clear why we say what we say. And so that's all we can do. If that's our job is to, to be that moral compass to say, this is the direction we think you should go and this is why we think you should do it. But so many of these governmental issues and these social oh, issues yes. always are going to be inside oh, yes. the church as well, as well yes. as inside the schools. Sure, absolutely they are. And, yeah. and, and so are other issues such as, uh, we were talking about scientific issues. Uh, you've had to deal with youth and uh, uh, life issues. Life life you, issues. You, yep. you have to deal with uh, mm -hmm. marijuana, medical marijuana. Yeah. Um, good healthy debate inside oh, yeah. churches are always good? Oh, sure they are. Sure they are. There, there, for us, there are some things that are not debatable. You know, that, that's pretty clear. These are the principles that we operate on. So, yeah, they're going to always have that. And, and, and things aren't always black and white. There is a, a whole spectrum in there where there is room for disagreement, for mm -hmm. co constructive criticism and all that. It's not all. Yeah, black and white, yeah. so to speak. Bishop-elect Thomas Zincula, what advice would you give him? Take your day off, you need it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you learn that early on? Oh, I know I've always taken my day off. <laughs> I've been, I'm very good about that. I, I have to. Not Sundays though, right? I haven't yeah. had a Christmas off in yeah, 49 I say, years. I was gonna say, it's <laughs> part of the job, isn't it? Well, I, I, I think he's, he's gonna have a, a tremendous learning curve. I mean, it's, being a bishop is different than anything else you do. You know, and, mm -hmm. and he's even said that. He said, I, I know how to be a parish priest. I was doing that. I know how to do these things. This is a whole new ball game. And so the learn, he's got to learn all the priest names. He's got to learn the parishes. He's got to learn the, the, the different things that go on within the Diocese of Davenport. But so take, take your time. You don't have to accomplish everything the first week. And he won't. He'll be good. It so. is a far-reaching diocese. I mean, oh, yeah. uh, uh, geographically, About three like hours. You said. Yeah, About way three over hours. to Newton yeah. and, and way down to Keokuk. Yep. Was that kind of nice to be visiting some of those churches and oh. some of those congregations? Oh yes. There, there, there are a couple of them that are in the uh, literally, literally in the middle of a cornfield. Yeah, that are yeah. the most beautiful things mm -hmm. you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Just beautiful churches. And a lot of times in those small little towns, the community is very, very close knit. And so you, you walk into a a community that's just thriving, just thriving. Well, I know you're counting down to retirement, I but am. you're going to stay as active as possible. And oh, will you ever come visit the Quad Cities again? Has Davenport yep. got a soft spot in your oh, heart? Oh, of course, absolutely. I've got a lot of friends here after 11 years. <laughs> I do, yeah, absolutely. I do. Bishop Martin John Amos, thank you so thank much. You, Jim. We appreciate thank you. you for all your work that you have done as thank well. Thank you, thank you. Well, we are heading into the Memorial Day weekend, and that means cyclists take over the village of East Davenport. More on the big changes, the criterium is still to come. But Laura Adams has some other great ideas for you, your family, and your friends if you plan to go out and about. This is Out and About from May 22nd to 28th. Hi, I'm Laura Adams. It's Military Appreciation Night at Modern Woodman Park on May 24th. All military personnel will receive discounted tickets. Lyra, a vocal ensemble from St. Petersburg, Russia, perform a concert of sacred and folk songs May 26th at Trinity Church in Rock Island. While Running Wild is holding a Wild Five, 5K Run Walk, beginning and ending at Unity Point Health, Trinity in Bettendorf on May 27th. All race proceeds will benefit the programs and services of Bethany for children and families. The German American Heritage Center is holding a special event, Houdini, the Mystery and Magic on May 28th. Or enjoy the sights and sounds and smells of yesteryear. The past will come to life at the village as interpreters and actors recreate pioneer life. It's all at Walnut Grove Pioneer Village's Heritage Days in Long Grove on May 28th and 29th. How do relationships fail? Check out the new Barn Owl series at Playcrafters Barn Theater as they present Constellations by Nick Payne, May 26th and 27th at 7.30. And Cirque 21 opens a new show, Snapshots, a musical scrapbook, a romantic comedy blending some of the best music from Stephen Schwartz's Broadway shows, beginning May 24th. For more information, visit wqpt.org. Thank you, Laura. Local singer-songwriter David G. Smith has written a few songs that have been used to honor heroes or raise money for good causes. A few years ago, he joined us to talk about his latest project, which included a song dedicated to the men and women who are first responders. It was part of a program to highlight the heroes of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. 
Well, on this Memorial Day weekend, we thought it might be fitting to hear once again David G. Smith and his song Angels Flew. sky exploded and folks didn't understand it. People were buried by metal and rock and dust and fear and panic. Subway streets and bridges were blocked. No one knew what was going on down there so they closed the island off when the towers came down. It was so sad. People were trapped. Here's what happened, angels flew across the water, round the wave, blew upon the harbor, came on wings of selfless hearts and lifted up bowers. Every boat available, the crews and all their captains Raced into a nightmare cloud of soot and smoke and madness Knowing that they might get hit again Thinking to themselves, this can't be happening When the towers came down On lower Manhattan People were trapped and here's what happened, angels flew Across to the heart Wave on wave They flew across the water Came on wings of selfless hearts And lifted up our eyes came down. The only way in and out of lower Manhattan was by water. A half, a, pe a half a million people were rescued that day by boat in just a little under nine hours. Later on, a crewman said that when the call came on the radio for help that if it could float, it was coming. That the entire horizon filled up with fireboats and charters and tugs and some of them, the Mary Gelatly, and John J. Harvey, and the U.S. Growler, and the Jill Rhino. There was a Samuel Newhouse, and the John D. McKean, New York Waterways, and the Staten Island Ferries. There was the Amberjack. Get to and the one that said it all, the resolute. Across the water, wave on wave, they flew into the harbor. Angels flew across the water. Wave on wave to save our sons and daughters that came on wings of selfless hearts and lifted up our walls. David G. Smith and Angels Flew. He is touring in Kansas right now, but returns to our area next month, playing at the Bettendorf Library on June 8th and the Big Muddy Beach Party later on in June. Well, this is the big weekend for competitive cycling with races in Burlington, Muscatine, and the annual Criterium in the cities, once again in the village of East Davenport. But the Quad Cities Criterium is different this year. For one thing, its name, 
has changed. And joining us is John Harrington of the Quad City Bicycle Club and the organizer of the 2017 Quad Cities Quick Star Criterium. Robin Rollins, the organizer of the Kohler Electric Kids Race. Sponsorships everywhere, but that's what you really need, John. Is that not true? Sponsorships are the life of the Criterium. Absolutely. And every year it's a chase for sponsorships. And we're so fortunate this year to have Quick Star join us. And what does that mean? I mean, it, it, it allows you to do what? Well, with a title sponsor like Quickstar, that's a lot of money. And so those folks are a major part of the race. Without them, it would not happen. Now, when I got to the Quad Cities about 20 years ago, the race was down in Belgian Village. And my favorite part was the kids' race. I'm sorry, the races are very cool. That kids' race on the morning, Monday morning, is one of the best featured events that occurs. And Kohler Electric got involved in that this year. We did. When it went, when it was offered to um, the East Village, one of our employees, he's an avid bike rider, mm -hmm. and he brought Tom Schuler and his organization with the bike club to our company. And we were given that opportunity to sponsor the kids race, which we thought was a really good fit for us. Mm -hmm. And we've just had a blast doing it. It's, it's been just super working with the kids and they have such a great time. Because it's not just bikes. There's a couple Hot Wheels out there too, aren't there? We have I remember all kinds right? of. <laughs> we, we have all kinds of bicycles and all kinds of helmets and all levels of riders mm -hmm. with the kids. We have some that like to go full blast. We have some that just kind of take their time, but at the end, they're all equally excited. Well, John, let's be honest. I mean, it just kind of underlines the fact that this is a family event. It is a family event, and uh, I want to add something to what Robin mm -hmm. mentioned, and, and that is when uh, she started it, and she actually runs the event with my wife, um, there were 25 kids. Last year there were 50, this sh last, excuse me, last year there were 75, and this year you're shooting for? We would like to have over 100. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and the kids are so cute. It's so, so much fun to watch them take part in it. Yeah. And, and anything competitive like that, you know, it just adds a little something to the entire event, does it not? I think it does. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And this year we're going to add a helmet contest because helmets are required. Mm -hmm. They do need to bring their own bicycle and then they, they are required. Even if you're on the Hot Wheel, you have to have a helmet. Yeah. So this year we decided, well, why not have a helmet contest? And that's what we'll be doing before the race starts. And the other thing we're adding this year is the Mississippi Bend Trikes organization. And they are an organization that started in, in January of 16 here locally in Iowa, Illinois and they pro build and provide adaptive bikes for children who cannot ride a traditional bike. Mm -hmm. So this will be their debut, and we're hoping to have maybe a dozen or more of those, and that's really, exci that's really exciting. And, and we're excited to be able to add this element into the bikes rake, bikes, bike race and be really inclusive of all the kids in the community. Well, let's talk about the adults as well. One of the big draws is you got a bigger purse this year, do you not? We do. So we're part of the Midwest Flyover Series. It takes place over five weekends in four states, so about 15 different races. And so in addition to the $10,000 cash that we will hand out on Memorial Day, that series will hand out about $24,000 cash. And I thought it was interesting also is that the uh, it, it's equal winnings whether you're a man or a woman. That's a big change. So about five years ago, uh, professional races across the United States started to equalize payouts mm -hmm. for the pro men and women. Only about 20% of the races today do that. And so we decided that we would do that for our pro men and women, for the, for the uh, men and women that end up on the podium they will get equal prizes uh, different than in our 51 years prior. Why is that important? It's important because it's a change that's occurring uh, in all sports and it's a change that's happening in our sport and we think too that uh, it's going to attract more ladies to our races and actually even before race day we have more pro women signed up than we did race day last year. Well that's great. What, as the casual observer, should people be looking for? I mean, do you have some exciting uh, racers, some uh, uh, cyclists that are going to be out there? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, it turns out that uh, the podium, that is the top three men uh, that won last year, are back this year. And actually, eight of the top ten are back. Well, and that's a big deal. I mean, that also speaks well for the criterion. It does. And it turns out, too, that the fellow that won last year won the year before. So he's going for the record trying to win uh, three times in a row. So his name is Josh Johnson. He's already signed up and he has uh, taken advantage of our host housing program where uh, my wife is responsible for 
uh, making homes available for the racers. Did that just start last year? It did. Uh, it formally started last yeah. year. I mean, it was always kind it, of done in some homes, it, I assume. It's always been informal, mm -hmm. and so last year uh, we had 16 houses that wanted to host, and we had six teams take advantage. Same 16 this year, but we're up to 11 teams that are taking advantage. Now, Robin, when we're talking about the bike races for the kids, registration is advanced, or can you do it right then and there? You can register that morning. We will be there at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, it is ages 3 through 10. And there's waivers to sign, mm -hmm. and we'll make sure you have your helmet. That's perfect. And so just, just come. Yeah, is it just that easy? It, it's really just that easy. The hardest part is probably talking mom and dad into bringing the bike. <laughs> that is true. Yep. And, and John, we're looking for pretty good weather for Monday. So I mean, I mean, we've you've had you've had everything. I mean, mm -hmm. you've had rain out. You've had everything. So uh, the fans should really enjoy a good weekend in Burlington, Muscatine, and the Quad Cities. Monday, perhaps being the best of the three. Actually, Monday does look to be the best <laughs> of the three, and it looks to be 75 degrees and a tailwind going up the hill to help the racers up the hill. So enjoy Memorial Day weekend. Remember what it's all about, but make sure you come to the Criterion because so much great racing. It's in the village and you love this new location. It's a great location. And uh, one, one reminder for the fans is, hey, start at the start finish line and then walk up to the top of the hill and watch the racers race up the hill and watch them grind around that top corner and then go to the bottom of the hill and watch them flying at 40, 50 miles an hour. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, not being on the bike, it's a lot of fun. For me, yeah, the spectator would be much easier. John right. Harrington, Robin Rounds, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. Have fun this weekend. And it's great to see all these people coming into the Quad Cities and experiencing a little bit more of what we have to offer. So, WQPT is doing its part to support the military men and women in the cities who are serving our nation. We call it embracing the military. The Arsenal's Leisure Travel Office has a couple great trips being offered in the coming weeks. Reservations are being accepted right now for a Cubs Cardinals bus trip to Wrigley Field. The June 4th game starts at noon and the $149 price includes round trip transportation and a ticket. You can find out more at the Leisure Travel Office and find out how you can make reservations online. And there's a second bus trip to Chicago later that week. That bus will take you to either Navy Pier or the Shedd Aquarium on Saturday, June 10th. You can explore the city right after. The cost for transportation, $41 per person. You can make your reservations right now with the Leisure Travel Office on Arsenal Island. On the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device. Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the city. Public Affairs Programming on WQPT is brought to you by The Singh Group at Merrill Lynch. Serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years.